This morning's Torah portion is Vaera. And Vaera means he appeared. It's God's appearing. And we're going to talk about how God appears at different times. You know, Hebrews 1, and this uh, verses 1 through 3, talks about how God has appeared in various times and in various ways. But in these last days, through, remember who? Through Yeshua. That's the ultimate appearing. And this is the story of Isaac. He appears and he announces the birth of Isaac. And he tells him uh, that he is the covenant child. And Isaac is a type of Yeshua, just as Abraham is a type of the father. So we're going to see a model there. In days gone by, times past, God spoke to us in many and varied ways to the fathers through the prophets. But now, in the Akharit Hayamim, this is the last days, He has spoken to us through His Son, to whom He has given ownership of everything, and through whom He has created the universe. This Son is the radiance of the Shekhinah, the very expression of God's glory and essence, upholding all that exists by His powerful Word. And after he had, through himself, made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of God in the holy place in heaven. This is the model that we're going to see in Isaac's sacrifice. We call the binding of um, we call it the binding in Hebrew because he wasn't actually sacrificed. The binding is called the Akedah. So whenever you hear a Jewish man talk about the Akedah, it's talking about the binding of Isaac with Abraham. And I'm going to go through with you a little overview of the chapters that we're going to look at, five chapters, and then we'll go through the parties and look at some of the symbolism that we're going to bring out in today's Torah portion. The passages are in, from chapter 18 through chapter 22. And chapter 18, God appears to Abraham, and he's down by the trees of Mamre. And we know this to be close to Hebron. And this is a very holy place. This is where the temple stood for seven years before David moved it up to Jerusalem. Chapter 19, two angels go on. So there's three that come to Abraham. Two go on to, uh, one to deliver Lot and the other to enact judgment upon Sodom. In chapter 20, we're going to see Avimelech. He's actually the king of a place called Gerar. This is the area of the early Philistines before they were known as Philistia. And the same thing that happened with Abraham calling Sarah his sister in Egypt happens also in Philistia with Avimelech, and Avimelech wants to take Sarah. But God turns the curse into a blessing. We see just as in the wealth taken from Nimrod and from Pharaoh, God uses Sarah, that when she's sent back from the house of Abimelech, she comes back with great riches. So Abraham's wealth just keeps growing and growing. And this is how God works in mysterious ways for the wealth of the nations. Because this wealth is going to preserve, you know, come down through Isaac and uh, Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel. In chapter 21, we see Yitzhak is born and Ishmael is sent away. And in our final chapter, we're going to look at the Akedah of Yitzhak, the binding of Isaac on the Temple Mount. Now, each week, we go through the parties, and the parties is our word for, that paradise comes from, and it's our word for orchard. We're going to be talking about the trees of Mamre this morning, and what's interesting is God has an orchard with much varied kind of fruit. And the Word of God is likened unto seed, right? And sometimes the seed's not obvious, sometimes it's within the fruit. It's not always like a blade of grass where the seed's on top and obvious. So we have the plain meaning of the word, much like the grain has the seed right in the obvious forefront. And the plain meaning of Vayera is God's going to appear to Abraham and he's going to announce in a year you're going to have a son at 100 years old. He's talking about the birth of Isaac, but it's also pointing to this model, this type of Yitzhak as a type of the Son of God who's going to come. This beloved Son of Abraham represents the beloved Son of God who would willingly lay down his life as a sacrifice. So, when we go into the Ramez, the meanings just beyond the literal, we always like to look at three main points. And the three main points are 
What does the Torah portion teach us about God's character? Each Torah portion has something unique to teach us about God's character. And it's so important for us to understand what God's character is really like because by beholding, we become changed into that same likeness. So this is part of the recreation, uh, returning us back to His image. And we see in this Torah's portion in chapter 18, verse 19, it's going to talk about tzedakah and mishpat, which are actually charity, like we take tzedakah, that's our charity box, um, but also judgment, and these balance one another. We're going to see charity in that he gives Abraham a son, charity in that he saves Lot, but judgment upon Sodom when their sins have reached the culmination. We also look for hidden glimpses of Messiah, and of course this is a very obvious uh, hidden symbol in Messiah being the Son of God willing to sacrifice himself. This is our model to realize that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. We're not physical beings needing to feed the physical, having an occasional spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings and we need to feed ourselves spiritually by the word of God more than we even feed ourselves with the physical food. This is what Yeshua was saying with man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If we're going to find the application for us today, we have to be willing to die to the self, to the ego, to the false identity, and live like Yitzhak and like Yeshua in humble obedience to the Father. There's a great model in this story for us. We're also going to see further symbolism of the Father and the Son in that Abraham did not kill Yitzhak. You know how many people in the world today and throughout the ages have thought that God had to kill Yeshua? You know, or as if God was separate when he says, My God, my God, why hast you forsaken me? This is what sin does. Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your sins have made a separation between you and your God. It's not God separating himself. God was right there within him, laying down his life. The ultimate reflection of selfless love to humanity. This is what Yeshua came to show, what God's character really looked like in action. So we see some beautiful glimpses there that the Father's hand was stayed, showing that no, the son is willing to sacrifice himself, but the father is not the one doing the killing. So there's beautiful models here. And then in the, uh, we always look for hidden anomalies in the Torah. Sometimes there's enlarged letters, sometimes there's small letters. In this week's Torah portion, we're going to see some nechud, which are dots that the scribes placed above certain words to bring out certain hidden elements. And that's in Genesis 18 as well. Then we're going to look, refer to some Dead Sea Scrolls uh, for the rest of the story and see how the Hoth Torah about the story of Elisha uh, blessing the Shulamite woman um, who was too old and she was barren to have a child. And she had a child just like Sarah was too old, miraculous birth of a son and how this son died and was raised to life. Another symbol like Yitzhak and like Yeshua of a miraculous birth of a son that the father loves and then it's going to die, but then it gets saved. And so we see this model coming through in every which way. So we'll just, without further ado, dive right in. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis, uh, Bereshit, chapter 18, verse 1. It says, Adonai appeared to Avram. Is that what your Bibles say? Yep. But you know in the Hebrew it doesn't say Avram? <laughs> it's a little trick. <laughs> I'll... Yeah, or Abraham. It doesn't say that in the original Hebrew. It says, Adonai appeared to him. What it's doing is it's differentiating the true identity from the false identity. Sometimes we think that we're our name, right? I think I'm Yitzhak bin David. I think I'm this body. I think I need to protect it. And what God's doing is sometimes He reaches us at our very core, at the Spirit that comes from Him, and He appears to us. And that's where He can actually best appear to us, when we're not involved in the self, when we are in the Spirit. And Abraham was specifically in the Spirit in a special way because he had just performed the Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcision, and he was in the apex in the most difficult day. He's in the third day after circumcising himself and Ishmael was 13. Abraham's 99. And Abraham is responsible for 318 other families that are kind of grafted into the family of Abraham. They all get circumcised as well. His servants 
all circumcised. This whole household, imagine all the men for three days, you know, and the pain gets the most intense. You can hardly stand up. And um, so here he is sitting in the shade of the trees of Mamre, and God appears to him, and not by name, but to his very core. Yes, Stephen. This one says unto him. Good. That's a correct translation. Yes, it was specifically yod heh vav -Heh. So we know, we're going to look at this a little bit further when we see the two angels and yod heh vav -Heh right there with him. By the, and it doesn't say oaks either. Sometimes trans English, you know, add a few things. It actually says trees, alone, of the Mamre. And Mamre was an area that was named after a person who it is said actually gave Abraham advice. And Abraham took that advice. Mamre gave Abraham advice um, to wait until God commands you to circumcise yourself. Know exactly the right time. And wear on the body. See, when God appeared to Abraham last, it was actually on Shavuot. And he said, in one year, you're going to have a son. And Yitzhak was born on Shavuot. Now, it would have been very easy because Shavuot is the time for renewal of covenant to circumcise yourself on that feast. But Mamre gave advice to wait a little while. So that way the feast could be done in, in its perfect, because there's a lot of sacrifices to do on Shavuot. And it was about a half a month later, this is in the fourth month, that Abraham is uh, circumcised. And also it is said that Mamre... Uh, gave him other knowledge uh, in the process of circumcision. But it's interesting that it talks to the area of Mamre, and Abraham is under these trees, and he's sitting at the entrance to the tent. Now, normally, sitting is yeshav. That's the Hebrew word. Yeshav is a yod, a sheen, and a vav. A vav looks like a standing man. But because Abraham is sitting, because he's in pain, he can hardly stand, do you know that, what's the two letters for the V sound in Hebrew? The vav or the, the vate, right. It uses the vate. Only time in scripture, because he's not standing. It's even showing that the little man that the vav represents in sitting can't stand, and yet Abraham's kindness is so great that when he sees these visitors, these strangers, he leaps up to go and serve them. That's how anxious he was to do uh, daka, to do acts of kindness. And so, this is in the very heat of the day, and it has a connotation of the brightest part, as if God's glory, his appearing, is even making it brighter and hotter. And he raises his eyes and he looks, and there in front of him stood three men. So God is appearing, and one of the things I like to bring out, when people have a problem with God manifesting himself in different ways, who are we to say how God can manifest himself, right? Sometimes people say, oh no, God's not going to appear as a man. No, we're not supposed to worship a man, according to the second commandment. Not supposed to make any graven image of anything in the heavens above, the earth beneath, or in the waters below the seas. But it doesn't mean that God can't manifest himself that way. And his word was made manifest in human flesh, and we see an exact representation of what God's character looks like in Yehoshua. But we see various Torah stories where God appears as either an angel or as a man to meet man where he's at, to be in physical form. So you see three coming. And upon seeing them, he leaps up and runs from the tent door to meet them. And he prostrates himself on the ground. Now, you would not normally do this for just a stranger. And you wouldn't even do it for angels. The angels, remember, through many times, like Daniel, they would say, no, no, I'm just a fellow bondservant like yourself. Do not bow down to me. But when it's the yod heh vav -Heh, as Archie brought out, they, then this worship, this prostration is accepted. And Abraham says, Adonai, Adoni, my Lord, if I have found Chen. Now, who was the first one to find Chen in the eyes of the Lord? Grace. Chen is grace. Remember Noah is uh, grace reversed and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham's familiar with the story of Noah and how God used Noah and spoke to Noah. And so he's actually asking for the same grace. If I have found this favor in your sight, please do not leave your servant. Please let me send for some water so that you can wash your feet and rest under the tree. And that's the way we feel when we come into God's presence, whether it's on Shabbat, we desire for Shabbat to last as long as possible, and we're sad when it's going. Or when you're deep in the Word and you're digging out nuggets, and sometimes 
you might take off work you might stay up all night long because you're like please do not leave my presence I just love being in your presence yes Archie the reason that he had, he had water brought to wash your feet was that the pagans of that day would worship the dust of their feet so you want to make sure that they weren't the pagans you want to make 100 percent sure yes of who he was uh, that's right he's the one and one of the few that serves the one true god el elyon el shaddai in the last couple Torah portions god's been revealing himself to him with various titles and he says i will bring a piece of bread lachem now you have come to your servant refresh yourself before going on very well they replied do what you have said so Avraham hurried into the tent and told Sarah, Quickly, three measures of the best flour, knead it and make cakes. Then Abraham ran to the herd. He took a good, tender calf, like Kobe beef, <laughs> and gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he took curds, which is curdled milk, uh, like cheese, and the calf, which he had prepared, and he set it before the men. Now it's interesting because we have laws in Israel uh, called kashrut. These are the laws of what's kosher, what's clean, um, what things can be cooked with one another. And one of the laws that has become fences is because of the text that says you shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk, which is talking about honoring the life and the source of life. You know, you can take one or you take the other, but don't cook the child in its mother's milk. That's just disgracing and dishonoring life. That's the principle behind that text. But the Jewish nation has taken it so far as to don't even eat milk and meat together. Don't eat meat and cheese together. And so one of the proof texts that I use to show that that's not the exact application or uh, intended meaning of that is here Abraham is serving Hashem himself and he's laying out this tender beef and he is laying down the curds with it and the bread so he's eating meat and cheese together now if there was any time to correct a misunderstanding that would have been the time to correct it but just interesting to let the scripture speak for itself it says they said to him now what's interesting in this word they said to him is this word is elev and elev is spelled Aleph Lamed can you see this down here see the Aleph and there's a little Lamed here okay and then there's a Yod and a Vav and there's three dots that are placed upon here now the common meaning Would the three dots be considered tagin? No. Tagin are at the top of letters. Oh, okay. These are called nakud. No, they're called nakud. Yeah, added by the scribes. And uh, here is a little picture of this verse, if you can see it in the Hebrew. Here's a lev. And see the three dots above it? So this is the word to him. And the sages say, this is in the context of, they said to him, what's the question? Where is Sarah? <clears throat> Over the Aleph, the Yod, and the Vav, there's a dot to teach that they knew her location, but they were respe showing respect to Abraham, asking him, kind of like, where is she? Sometimes you ask a question, where are you right now? You're deep in thought. Or where is your heart? Or not just a physical location. So that's one application of it. But, I also think it's significant that in the context of the theme of this Torah portion, we see the Father and we see the Son. Now the Father is known as Elohim, right? And Elohim is spelled with an Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet, it always represents God. The first dot is over the Aleph. Now why didn't it put a dot over the first three letters, Aleph, Lamed, Yod? Why is it Aleph, Yod, Vav? It actually skips the Lamed. Yod is the first letter of Yehoshua. This is how the Father is going to appear and manifest himself in human flesh, the Word made flesh. So that's the next dot. 
and the Vav is in the form of a man. This is an upright man. So even in the context of Vayera, we're seeing a deeper meaning to these three dots, bringing out a significance of how God is going to manifest himself. And it, Yeshua, in prophecy, is also referred to as the outstretched arm you know, of God's salvation, or the right hand of God. So this Yod is a hand. So it has double meaning as to Yehoshua. And then the Vav is the sixth letter of the Aleph Bet. Six is the number of man, and it also is the upright one. And he was an upright one. So there's all these beautiful, deep uh, meanings what that come up. Uh, that's not a dot. Uh, Those are not this is the top of the Lamed. And this is a dot, this is a dot, and this is a dot. But this is just the tall neck of the Lamed when it's drawn. But in, mm -hmm. my, in mine right here, I got two little dots by the Lamed. Okay, maybe cantillation. Okay, we'll look at that. Well, yeah, it's interesting. Many people have surmised which holy days uh, are these. You know, some have speculated Yom Kippur when he uh, circumcised himself. Some have speculated. We know it's one year before Isaac was born, and a lot of people traditionally have said Isaac could have been born on Passover, which would have put this at Passover. But we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that it was Shavuot. So this is just after Shavuot. This is actually in the fourth month, and it is known also that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in the fourth month of the year. Uh, yeah, because they were angels, and uh, he did. But was, was that during the Feast of Passover? No. Sometimes you just, uh, yeah, you didn't have time for quick uh, using, kneading flour with olive oil and such. You would just bake it very quickly. Yes, Jeff? So there's another, there's another thing that Isaac and I have talked about this. There's a, a misunderstanding of leaven, of what leaven is. So... In a nutshell, leaven is doctrine. Mm -hmm. You can have good doctrine and you can have bad doctrine. Right. And there's a teaching we can go through on all of this. But you would never present to an angelic being or to the Father doctrine. Mm -hmm. You would never present to them a, here's how you are to act. He would always present to us proper doctrine. So in one sense, you could say unleavened bread was... I am honoring you that I'm not going to tell you anything to do or present any doctrine to you. Yes, very good point. And that's a beautiful teaching in itself, the teaching of leaven and what it really represents. And there's many proof it texts to... be unleavened bread and he served it. Not in this text. In the case of Lot, it says matzah. In this case, if you read it in the Hebrew, you, you probably have your interlinear humash, it'll say lachem. Now lachem is a common term for any bread. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's risen, but it's just you can't definitively say that it's matzah because it's not using that word. So they ask, where is Sarah, your wife? And he says, there in the tent. He said, I will certainly return to you around this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. So around this time next year, this is just within a couple weeks of this time next year, sure enough, he was born on Shavuot, the covenant child born on the day that God makes covenant. So there's many things that have happened on Shavuot, including Noah making covenant with God, or God making covenant with Noah after the flood. Noah built the altar and actually had the sacrifices for Shavuot. Uh, we see Isaac's birth, and we also see that he, God appeared in this time. Now, he appears at Sinai a thousand years later um, on Mount Sinai, establishing the covenant of Ketubah with Israel. So it's interesting that he's appearing to Abraham, making covenant with him at the time that Abraham made covenant with him through the circumcision. All of this, Shavuot always screams covenant and renewal of the covenant. Covenants build upon one another. They don't do away with one another. So this is just beautifully uh, further proof that this is the time of Shavuot. And I will show you some proof text in a little bit that uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls that confirm that this... Uh, Yitzhak was born in the third month. So he said, I will certainly return to you around this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah heard him from the entrance of the tent. 
behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. Sarah was well past the age of childbearing, so she laughed to herself, thinking, I'm so old, and so is my Lord. And this is the way that Sarah showed respect for Abraham. In all the time that they were together, she treated him like a beautiful, with such respect, she even called him my Lord. The only time that she ever had an issue was when Hagar was coming between her relationship with uh, Abraham. So it's a good lesson for us in our marriages. Uh, we learned in a previous Torah portion that there was dots above that place where she said, let God be the judge between me and you about this Hagar and what she's doing. She's basically saying she's causing problems for us. And it's a lesson for us to never come between a husband and a wife. And a wife should always show respect for her husband unless God is, you know, revealing that somebody's coming between and she needs to speak up. And that's the only reason why Sarah spoke up is to preserve the relationship and the marriage. So she calls him my Lord, Abraham. Uh, am I to have pleasure again? So she's not just talking about childbirthing, but she's actually talking about making love. It's a beautiful thing. Adonai said to Avraham, Why did Sarah laugh and ask, Am I really going to bear a child when I am so old? Interesting how Hashem sometimes meets us right where we're at. What's your heart really saying? What's the intents of your heart and the thoughts of the mind? Is anything too hard for Adonai? At the time set for it, at this season next year, I will return to you, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh because she was afraid. But he corrected her and said, Not so, you did laugh. So the men set out from there and looked out towards Sodom. So basically they go from this area of Hebron and they go east to the area where the bluffs start going down and you can look down into the Jordan Valley. And they're going to look down and Adonai says, Should I hide from Avraham what I'm about to do? Inasmuch as Avraham is sure to become a great and strong nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by him. You know, Abraham was known for not just his kindness, but he had four traits, it says in the Gemara. It says he had wisdom, he had strength, he had wealth, and he had humility. And when you break these down as ap applying to us today, it's not just a head knowledge of knowledge, right? What is wisdom? It's really understanding what to do with knowledge and how that knowledge works. But more importantly, it's about that he always sought wisdom. It's not so much that I'm wise and you call yourself wise. Nobody, if they're humble, will ever call themselves wise. What it means is that Abraham was always seeking more about Hashem and Hashem's ways. He studied with Melchizedek for 40 years to learn the priesthood, even though he never had to officiate in the role of uh, high priest because Melchizedek lived not only 10 generations after the flood, but then past Isaac's life and into Jacob's life. And it wasn't until um, Jacob's life that he actually died and passed that mantle of priesthood onto Yaakov. So it's about us seeking wisdom, be an eternal learner, a lifetime learner of God's ways. And strength has a connotation of someone who overcomes the Yetzer Hurrah. It's not just about me overpowering you because that's force and that's not a part of the character of God. It's about an internal strength to overcome the self and the ego, to overcome the Yetzer Hurrah. Does everybody know what the Yetzer Hurrah is? The evil inclination. The evil inclination is really the self just trying to rise in one's life for supremacy and trying to... Well, the, the two things can't thrive together. You know, if you're feeding the self and the ego and the flesh and, and gluttony and all of this, the spirit is going to suffer. If you fast once in a while and you pray and you, through the study the Word of God, that's true spiritual food, the spirit will thrive, and that's what we're intended to be is thriving spiritual beings. And the body will be a perfect vessel, a more perfect vessel to carry the spirit. And so it's all about having strength and overcoming the Yetzir Hurrah. And of course, the wealth was not wealth that he had to take by force, but the wealth that God blessed him with. And that's why we should all be content with whatever God gives us and be faithful with it. And he who's faithful with a few things, God will make ruler of many. And this is the way Abraham was faithful. And of course, his humility and his kindness was well known throughout the, the land and throughout the ages. So just something to kind of meditate on when it talks about even Hashem is 
kind of complimenting Avraham. He says, he's going to become a great and strong nation, and all the nations of the world are going to be blessed by him and his descendants. For I have made myself known to him, so that he will give orders to his children and to his household. So, I wanted to go back one slide and talk a little bit about these different areas of Abraham appearing in the form of a man. He appears to convey that Sarah is going to have a son in verse 10 that we just read. And he's going to appear in the next verse to evoke a spirit of mercy in Abraham. He's basically letting him know, I'm about to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. What this does by telling him in advance, it's like Moshe when he tells him, I should just destroy the children of Israel and make a great nation out of you. What does it do? It reveals the true character. If you're selfish, you're going to say, yeah, do that. <laughs> if you're unselfish and you're humble and you're meek, you're going to say, no, I would rather die, blot my name from the book of life, than for you to hurt or for any of the children of Israel to um, be affected. So this is evoking a spirit of mercy in Abraham to save uh, any righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. God appears to Abraham in the form of an angel and also in the form of a man uh, to save Yitzhak from being sacrificed and to show that God will provide his own lamb as a sacrifice. And we see in what we just read in Hebrews 1, 1 through 5 that God was using this as a model for what he was going to do through his son, his only begotten son. Now, God has many sons. Even Adam was a son of God. But he's planted his seed in different ways, right? All the other sons of God in the universe, he has spoken into existence. And remember in the book of Job, all the sons of God have come to gather themselves and give an account of the dominion that God has entrusted to them. These were created beings spoken into existence. Adam was unique in that he not only created them in his image, he formed them from the dust of the ground with his own hand and breathed his seed, his DNA, through breath, through his nostrils. And it says he became a living nefesh, a living soul. Yeshua, Yehoshua, is called the only begotten Son of God because it's the only time that that word was planted as seed in the womb of a woman and he was actually birthed. And so this is the uniqueness of Yehoshua. But God is appearing, manifesting his word in different ways. But they're all different sons, Yeshua being unique in that he's the only begotten. You know the brightness of his glory? Uh-huh. You know, in John it says... Uh, they all may be one, as thou, Father, are within me, and I am thee, and they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou art sent me, and the glory, or the honor, or the shekinah, which thou gavest me, I have given them. Amen. It's a perfect text. It fits. And that shows our calling also. That's our purpose is to return back into him where he is all in us and we are one in him. It's kind of like his spirit is like droplets of an ocean, right? Each one of us have the spirit of God within us. That's our true identity. Together, we comprise this ocean. But we are not God, right? May God be all in us. May we be each one in him. So this is where New Age kind of goes off and they start to realize, get a, a little knowledge is dangerous, right? You realize, wow, that spark of life in me, that is divine. Oh, that means I'm God. <laughs> and then you go off in the wrong tangent. So he says, I'm going to make myself known to him and will give orders to his children and to his household after him to keep my ways and to do what is right and just. English translates it as right and just, but it's sadaka and mishpat, which means charity, acts of kindness, and judgment. We're going to see Hashem not only being charitable and saving Lot for Abraham and giving Abraham a child in his old age, but he has to enact justice. And it is said that it was at the point that Sodom had killed one of Lot's daughters in such a horrific way. Remember what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was? It was more than the homosexuality, it was the unkindness to strangers. Now, Lot was a righteous man. He knew, even though he wasn't perfect, right? He made a lot of mistakes, but he knew the ways of God through, his Ab through Abraham, Uncle Abraham, who took him under his wing like his own son. And he's had to pass on this knowledge to his children. Now, his wife wasn't always on board with it and didn't always perform, and that's also passed down to us 
but his daughters were trying to perform acts of kindness in the most unkind place in the world. And it is said that she hid some bread for a hungry pa uh, sojourner, somebody passing through Sodom. She hid it in a, a vessel so that nobody else would know. But when the people found out about it, that she was actually being kind to a stranger instead of robbing him like everybody else did, they stripped her and put honey on her and put her in on the wall of the city where there was a beehive. And the bees came and stung her until she died. It's at that point that the sins, you know how the sins pile upon one another and even Revelation says your sins have reached heaven. It's that point that Hashem said, there has to be justice. There has to be judgment. This cannot continue. And so this is some of the knowledge that's passed down through the ages. And God says that he's going to teach Abraham and his descendants what is right and what is just, what is sadaka, what is charitable, and what is right judgment, so that Adonai may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Adonai said, The outcry against Sodom and Amorah is so great, and their sin is so serious, that I will now go down and see whether their deeds warrant the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Avraham stayed, remained standing before Hashem. So this means out of the three, two of them went on to Sodom, right? Now there's two angels there with Hashem. One uh, informed Sarah that she was going to have a son while, she, while they were there with her. And then he went on to go and deliver Lot. Um, one angel, and we know the angel's name, Raphael, he was the angel of healing. And he actually had an, a part in healing Abraham during this time of the circumcision. It was actually very like a healing balm, just this visit from this angel Raphael that came with uh, Hashem. So each one even had their purpose, and this isn't often brought out. You usually have Gabriel as the interpreter of dreams or a messenger. Um, we don't know, uh, or I haven't done enough research to tell you who the other uh, angel's name was, but we know that he informed Sarah, and then he went on to uh, save Lot from the city of Sodom and to destroy the city. And the other angel was the one to heal. But Abraham stay, remains with Adonai, or Adonai remains with Abraham. Raphael healed Sarah while he was there. Yes, healed her womb. Yeah. Very good. I love it. It fits the principle. So the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before Adonai. Abraham approached and said, Will you actually sweep away the righteous with the wicked? This has a connotation of Abraham when it says he approached him and said this. In Hebrew, this is layigash. It has a connotation of drawing near to Hashem, very close to intercede. And this is a model for us in prayer. When you see that somebody is doing something in their life, that they're creating a cause and effect, that they're going to lose the blessings that Hashem has intended for them, we draw especially near. And the only way to do that is through fasting, through holiness, through purity of our own life. And in our prayer life, we intercede for that person. This is what Abraham was doing. Will you actually sweep away the righteous with the wicked? He didn't know how many righteous were there, but he knew his nephew Lot was there. Maybe there are 50 righteous people in the city. Will you actually sweep the place away and not forgive it for the sake of the 50 righteous who are there? Far be it from you, Hashem, to do such a thing, to kill righteous along with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Now, God doesn't have to kill anybody. Sin... It's the wages of sin, right? That is death. But what Abraham's doing is saying, don't let the righteous die along with the wicked when judgment comes upon the city. So many times, cities and nations have been saved because of a few righteous. And that's when we pray for this nation and we pray for the nation of Israel, it's the same way. We need to make sure that our lives are in the right place so that if, you know, because you can't change anyone else, you can't count on anyone else, but if we can be righteous, we can be a saving grace for others who need more time. So he's bartering with Hashem. If there's 50, will you still? Far be it from you to do such a thing. Shouldn't the judge of all the earth do what is just? Adonai said, If I find in Sodom 50 who are righteous, then I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Avraham answered, Hear now, 
I who am but dust and ashes. He's humbly <laughs> coming again to Hashem. I've taken it upon myself to speak to yod heh vav -He. What if there's five less than 50 righteous? He said, I won't destroy it if I find 45 there. He spoke to him yet again. What if there's just 40 found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I wouldn't do it. He said, I hope yod heh vav -He will not be angry with me if I speak. What if there's 30 found there? And Hashem answered, I won't do it if there's 30. He said, here now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to Adonai. What if there's only 20 found there? And Hashem said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. He said, I hope Adonai won't be angry with me if I speak just once more. It's so cute. <laughs> it's like you're bold enough to be able to even speak to God audibly, face to face. You know, he's appearing to him. And then... <laughs> kind of this bartering process, you know, is less than what you would do with the king of the universe. What if ten are found there, he said. For the sake of the ten, I will not destroy it. And then Adonai went on his way so that Abraham could not barter any longer. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, Adonai must have vanished and Abraham returned to his place. So now this brings us to the focus of the angels in Sodom and Gomorrah. Chapter 19, verse 1. Be yes? The only thing I was thinking about, it was almost obvious that God himself came down to be there, standing next to Abraham, knowing what was going to happen. Yes. And it, was, it, was a, it was a lesson of a type, so that it was not uh, random that he came and stood next to Abraham. That's right. Because he could have just sent the angels that's right. Absolutely. This is developing Abraham's character and preparing him for something greater. And it's developing his faith, too. Imagine how much faith you would have for the rest of your life's mission if you had spoken face-to-face -face with Adonai. One thing become real obvious is Abraham never went and visited Lot and Sodom. Right. There was... The only time that he went to inquire, uh, he sent his servant, Eliezer. So he really doesn't know what's going... And this is another thing about a righteous man, that you don't spend long periods of time in wicked areas. Abraham really kept himself separate. And that's what holy means, to be set apart. That's to be sanctified. So through our sanctifying process in our life, we have to make sure that we, by association, are not becoming contaminated, that we're not associating with evil uh, or fellowshipping with the wicked, that we are set apart from the paganism of the past, that we are truly called out in so many ways like Abraham, our father. As we look at this, um, the sins of Sodom, there's an interesting scripture in the prophet Ezekiel that talks more about what the sins of Sodom were. So if you have your Bibles, turn uh, to Ezekiel 16, verse 49. And you can correlate this with your Torah portion for chapter 19. Verse 49 says the crimes of your sister Sodom were pride and gluttony. Think about those two things in the context of what I said about the self and either we're crucifying the flesh daily or we're feeding the flesh and the false ego, right? <clears throat> pride comes from self. From self-focus. Gluttony is the body feeding the flesh. Everything they were doing was in exact opposition to the thriving of the true identity, the spirit. And then look how it breaks down pride and gluttony further. She and her daughters were careless and complacent, so that they did nothing to help the poor and the needy. This is what pride and gluttony looks like. When you're so full of yourself and you're feeding yourself, your whole focus is only on yourself, that... It, it's one thing when you don't help others. That's bad enough as it is. But they were actually robbing. Instead of helping the people, the foreigners who they're supposed to help, they're robbing the foreigners and the sojourners. <clears throat> they were arrogant, verse 50 goes on to say, and they committed disgusting acts before me, so that when I saw it, I swept them away. So arrogance goes with pride. Gluttony 
is all about feeding the flesh in different ways. We often think about it food, right? But what were the disgusting acts of gluttony that they were practicing? Not only overindulgence in food, but sexual immorality as well. So I think it sums it up beautifully through the prophet Ezekiel. And now with that understanding, we will go back <coughs> and look at chapter 19. The two angels came to Sodom that evening when Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. So here it's clarification. Only two of them went. Lot saw them, got up to greet them, and prostrated himself on the ground. <clears throat> he said, Here now, my lords, please come over to your servant's house. Spend the night. Wash your feet. Get up early and go on your way. No, they answered, we will stay in the square. So this is another way of them testing him. <clears throat> is he truly going to perform the acts of kindness like his uncle Abraham? He wanted to protect them. This is why he asked them to come inside the house. Because if they were left out in the square, he knew the people would end up finding that there was visitors and try to have their way with him. <clears throat> so he kept pressing them. So they finally went home with him. And he made them a feast. Not just a meal, but this is a mishtin, mishteh. And he baked matzah for their supper, which they ate. Yes. But it doesn't mean that it was Passover. That's the thing. We can't... <clears throat> but we know that this was in the fourth month, so this isn't the time of year for Passover. But it's the same type of meal that you would eat in the Feast of Matzah. But before they could go to bed, the men of the city surrounded the house, young and old, everyone from every neighborhood of Sodom. Now what caused this? It is said that when Lot was showing the kindness of Abraham and bringing in these guests, Lot's wife didn't want to share what they had with these guests. And she says, if you bring them in, then let's divide the house. You keep them on your portion of the house. When he went to cook a meal for them, he wanted to make covenant with them. And how do you make covenant or preserve the covenant? Salt. So there was not enough salt in the house. So he, unfortunately, there was enough salt, but she didn't want to give her own salt. This is how self-centered. She had become much like Sodom. There was this division, unequally yoked, Lot was with his wife. So she went to the neighbors and asked for salt, even though she had salt and in the process gossiped about having visitors and it was because of that act of Lot's wife that the whole town came uh, to Lot's door and demanded that he send them out. <clears throat> Before they could go to bed, the men of the city surrounded the house, young and old, everyone from every neighborhood of Sodom. They called Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to stay with you tonight? Bring them out to us. We want to have sex with them. Lot went out to them and stood in the doorway, closing the door behind him. He said, Please, my brothers, do not do such a wicked thing. Look, here, I have two daughters who are virgins. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do whatever seems good to you. But don't do anything to these men, since they are guests in my house. Now, Lot knew that the practice of these men were sodomy, and... He really didn't, wasn't wanting to put his daughters at harm's way, but he was like calling their bluff, you know, using this to know, knowing that they were not going to take his daughters. They wanted these two handsome men, these angels who had come into town. Isaac? Yes. I remember right. Wasn't Lot wealthy and uh, relatively powerful when he came because they invited their birds? So would we have had other men, guards, and maybe a little. Yeah, but that's the problem. You bring out a really good point because when you have an estate and you have acreage, you know, you can guard that. When you choose to live in the city, you lose your power of protecting your... Yes, I do. And he was choosing to live in the city. And, and you know how many people love the amenities? They come from, they say, wow, I can just walk right outside my condo and there's a restaurant and there's this and there's that. and there's... So the, the amenities of the city suck us in. God never designed for his people to live uh, in cities which will, always will be hotbeds of wickedness. Pleasures. Yes, and the pleasures of the 
self again it feeds the self and the materialism of the city feeds the self as well but yeah these are really good points that uh, the spirit is bringing out this morning because we have to apply them to our life and say where would God have us he wants us to be out in nature he wants us to be sustainable he wants us to be eating just what we need to sustain the vessel for housing the spirit but not overindulgence and not be focused on materialism to be free enough to multiply our wealth where we can be a blessing to others and where we're breathing God's good clean air and drinking his good clean water and these are not things that you have access to in the city you're going to be drinking the chlorine water showering in it you're going to be uh, sucking the fumes of the carbon monoxide from the thing you know but you're doing you're making all these sacrifices for the self and that's exactly the opposite of the principle of god well, you how, uh, alluring wealth yes and how quickly it can destroy we must Keep the focus that nothing is ours. We are only stewards of what God has entrusted. And we will lose even what he's entrusted to us if we don't use it in acts of kindness for his children and for his kingdom. So, these men would hear nothing of it. They said, stand back, we're going to break on through. This guy came to live here, speaking of Lot, and now he's decided to play judge. For that will deal worse with you than with them. Then they crowded in on Lot in order to get close enough to break down the door. But the angels inside reached out their hand and brought Lot into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so they couldn't find the doorway. The men said to Lot, Do you have any people here beside yourself? Whomever you have in the city, sons-in-laws, sons, daughters, bring them out of this place, because we're going to destroy it. Adonai has become aware of the great outcry against them, and Adonai has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke with his son-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, let's leave this place, because Adonai is going to destroy the city. But his son-in-laws wouldn't take him seriously. And that's the way even the people in the city will be when God sends them a message through his servants the prophets judgment is coming upon the cities it's time to get out leave whether it's a city or a country that's going to receive judgment people are like the frogs in the warm water they're lukewarm and they won't take it seriously yes. second peter brings out an interesting aspect about lot and you know how i always incorporate both the written Torah and the oral Torah passed down from the fathers through the sages, from God to Moses to Joshua. There's an interesting thing that popped out at me just this uh, yes, yesterday. Second Peter says in chapter 2, verse 4 through 9, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be rescued unto judgment. Remember, we were talking about God's characteristics. And alongside of his charity and his acts of kindness, you see that he's not going to allow wickedness to continue. He's, what he's doing is he's preserving life from the lambs slain from the foundation of the world. Normally, sin would kill a person immediately, right? It's his mercy, his sadaka, his charity, and his kindness in extending life. But justice is such that you can't do that forever just to allow people to keep sinning and hurting one another. At some point, you have to say, you've wanted to sever yourself from me? I'll allow you. And that's what's called the wrath of God in Romans 1, to give men over to the lust of their hearts. So his judgment is not an arbitrary act of destruction. That's what I want people to get through their minds. God is so good. He's only a life giver, not a life taker. But when you sever yourself through sin from the source of life, inherent in everything else outside of that is death, right? That's the domain of death. So here it refers to first to these angels that corrupted man before the flood, the watchers. And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. So we're going to look at righteousness and judgment. Bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Amorah into ashes, he condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example for those after who would choose to live an ungodly life. And he del delivered just Lot. This is the first thing that jumped out at me. Oh, they're calling Lot just. I know he wasn't perfect, but... And nowhere in the Torah does it say he was just, right? Nowhere in the Torah does it say he was righteous. Look at how Peter goes on. 
He was vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. So he's choosing to live in the city, but he can't even stand to hear the words that are, and the th deeds that are being done all around him. It vexed his very soul. It says, for that righteous man, Peter's calling him a righteous man, dwelling among them, the wicked, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. So he's delivering Lot out. So here it's calling Lot just, righteous, righteous soul, godly. And God knows how to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment, to be punished. When, when you get to know the Torah and you write it upon your heart, and then you go back to the Brit Hadashah, and that's the proper way to do it, you know, write God's word upon your heart, the scriptures that the prophets and the patriarchs had, that Yeshua had and his disciples had, then when something like this jumps out at you, I mean, immediately you know because Torah's written upon your heart, that's not from Torah, that's not from the scriptures, where did they get that? You know where Peter got that from? The oral Torah. He's quoting the oral Torah. It's only there. And it was after he wrote this. So the oral was oral for thousands of years, right? And it was only around, I would say, 160 years after Yeshua that it was actually codified and written down. So at this point, it's still oral and it's being passed down. But by the time they write the Mishnah and the Talmud, this is being recorded. And we have a proof. And let me show you. The Bible doesn't mention Lot's wife by name, but the rabbis refer to her as Edith. This is from the Mish, uh, Mishnah on Vayera, this Torah portion. This woman's sorry in teaches of her life. Even though she was rescued from the upheaval of Sodom, she was stricken together with the other inhabitants of the city, from which the rabbis conclude that her actions, as well, were no different from those of the rest of Sodom's populace. She was basically self-centered, that's what it's saying. Jealousy of others, she offered no hospitality to guests. The angels did not initially want to be her guests, but rather they accepted. This is why they, he had to pretty much beg the angels to come. They didn't even want to be in the house with Lot's wife, but they finally accepted because of Lot's righteousness. But rather those of her husband Lot, since he was more righteous. That's in Rabbah 10.5. She even tried to bar their entry to the house. Lot's wife divided their house into two parts and told her husband, if you want to receive them, do so in your part. Lot wanted the members of his household to participate in the meritorious act of hospitality, as had Abraham, and he asked his wife to bring them salt. She responded, do you even wish to learn this bad habit from Abraham, giving what you have you know, to others? They don't deserve it. She finally complied with her husband's request, but she acted cunningly in order to remove the guests from her house. She went to her, the woman neighbors to borrow salt. This is oftentimes the beginning of problems <laughs> when women get together and start shriving, complaining, right? You know what my husband's doing? He's so foolish. He's giving stuff that we have. To... So they found out that she had guests. They asked her, why don't you need salt? Why don't you prepare enough beforehand? She answered, I took enough for our own needs, but guests came to us, and it is for them that I need salt. In this manner, all the people of Sodom knew that Lot was harboring guests. They stormed his house and demanded that he hand them over to the townspeople. This is from Mishnah Agadah. The Agadah is the part of Talmud that it tells stories, and, like parables. That's where parables come from. Because she sinned through salt, Lot's wife was punished by being turned into a pillar of salt, the exact same material that she was selfish with. Okay? The pillar of salt was left by God as a memorial for all time. Did you know that where they fled, because this was before the Dead Sea uh, waters were in the northernmost place. In that northern place, there was five cities. And you're going to see in this text that Lot actually asked to flee to one of them. And... Uh, they fled, instead of going up towards Abraham on the west side, for those of you that have been to Israel with me, you know how the Dead Sea runs north and south. You can either run to the west, up towards Jerusalem, or you could run to the east and you'd be up in Jordan, right? This is the way that Lot and his wife uh, went to one of these other cities. And it's amazing that orally they passed down that because of this, it would be a memorial for all times, for our learning to not ever be selfish like Lot's wife was. Moses, it is said, saw the pillar of Lot's wife when God showed him all the land of Canaan before his death. 
So he was passing right through that same area, and he saw this pillar of salt. Anyone who sees Lot's wife is required to recite two blessings. The first, blessed be the one who remembers the righteous, expresses thanksgiving and praise to God for having remembered Abraham, by the merit of whose righteousness he saved Lot and his wife from the upheaval. This blessing relates to the miracle that was performed for Lot. The second blessing, blessed be the true judge. We say, when somebody dies, it's recited for the punishment visited on Lot's wife. A late Agadah, a story in the Talmud, relates that Lot's wife stands in her place to the present day. So I thought I would try to find a couple pictures to show you this. Every day passing oxen licked her feet. You know how cows love the salt blocks? And so she used to have like this robe, and it was much wider. And over the years, it's gotten thinner and thinner because it's been licked upon by the passing people with their cattle and sheep. Every day, passing oxen licked her feet, and every morning she rises once again to her previous shape as a pillar of salt. So this is the north part of the Dead Sea. This is Sodom and Gomorrah being rained on by fire. And you're standing up in Jordan looking down into the valley. And here's this pillar of salt. And then you know the big bluffs, the big cliffs that are on the opposite side of the Dead Sea, where Masada is and the Qumran Caves and all of that? That's on the other side. Now I'm going to show you a real picture. Here, here's the bluff, the cliffs on the other side. Okay. Here's the Jordan side, and here's that pillar of salt to this day. These are powerful things that are passed down to us from father to son for thousands of years. Yeah, this is on the east side of the northern part of the um, Dead Sea, and this is where th those five cities would have been down in the valley here. So this would have been a lush green valley, and that's why it's dead. There's so much salt in that area because of the sulfur and brimstone. Yes. So now we'll read the story from the Torah. When the morning came, the angels told Lot to hurry. Get up, they said, and take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Otherwise, you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he dallied. So the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters. Adonai was being merciful to him and led them, leaving them outside of the city on this side. When they had brought them out, he said, Flee for your life. Don't even look behind you. And this is a lesson for us today. When God is calling us out, whether he's calling you out of a false religious system or a wicked city or any number of things that we are being called out as called out believers, don't look back. Sometimes you go strong for a while, but then you kind of miss the things of the past. You have a memory of sin in your life. And sometimes people backslide don't look back. Look what happened. He says, Do not look behind you. Do not stop anywhere in the plain, but escape to the hills. Otherwise you will be swept away. Lot said to them, Please, no, my lord. Here, your servant has already found favor in your sight, and you've shown me any, even greater mercy by saving my life, but I don't want to go to the hills. He didn't want the country life. He asked to go to another wicked city. Now remember there was five cities. Only two of those five are being destroyed at this current time. The other city, remember the four kings that came from the north in last week's Torah portion, and they took all of the possessions and the people, the souls from those five kings in the, of the different cities, and we listed those different cities? Well, he asks to go to one of those cities, and that was called Zaor. He says... Um, You've uh, helped me. You've had mercy on my life, but I don't want to go to the hills. I'm afraid of the disaster. The disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, there's a town nearby to flee to, and it's a small one. So please let me escape there. Isn't it just a small one? And that way I will stay alive. He replied, All right, I agree with what you have asked. I won't overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Otherwise, Zaor would have been overthrown as well. He allows Lot to go there, and that one righteous man preserves the whole city. Hurry and escape to that place, because I can't do anything until you arrive there. For this reason, the city was named Zoar. The original name was Bela, and which we read in the last week's Torah portion, which means small. What By the like yeah, it smells like rotten eggs. <laughs> By the time Lot had come to Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. So this means he's running at night, and this is what we're told that our flea will be. Um, 
Then Adonai caused sulfur and fire to rain down upon Sodom and Amora from Adonai out of the sky. He overthrew those cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and everything growing in the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a column of salt. So is there anything that we're looking back on, or is there anything that we are holding onto? Abraham got up early in the morning, went to the place where he had stood before Adonai, and looked out towards Sodom and Amorah, scanning the entire plain. Now there's a lot of caves up in the hillside here. This whole eastern side, this is also, the east side of the Galilee had a lot of caves, that's where the demoniac were uh, residing, but this is the east side of the... Uh, that's extremely rough going. It sure is. That's extreme. So... Abraham, now the story breaks and looks at what Abraham's doing. He has heard that Sodom and Amorah have been destroyed. He gets up early in the morning and he goes to the place where he stood before with the Lord. And he looks out towards Sodom and Amorah, scanning the entire plain before him. And the smoke was rising from the land like the smoke of a furnace. But when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he sent Lot out, away from the destruction, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. Lot went up from Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters, because he was afraid to stay in Zoar. And he and his two daughters lived in a cave. And they assumed that the other cities had been destroyed, and the way that it looked from all the smoke, they began to assume that they were the only ones left on earth. This is why Lot's daughters thought that they needed to procreate to keep the human species alive. Yes, Deborah. Why didn't they Debbie. Go see their uncle Abraham? Yeah, well they're so you can't even see, let's say Abraham's overlooking on this side of the hill. Maybe I should do it with this. So where Abraham is, is over here, looking down. There's no water here. These are all the five cities. And all you're seeing is smoke. So you can't even see across. And you can't go through it. So Lot's on this side. Abraham's on this side. And he doesn't know what's become of the rest of the world. So Lot goes up from Zaor. And he lives in this cave. The firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there isn't a man on earth to come out to us in the way. Speaking of the Derek, this is the way customary in the world. Basically, they're saying that um, they're not going to be able to procreate. Come, let us have our father drink wine, and then we'll sleep with him. And that way we'll, be in, be, we'll enable our father to have descendants. It's interesting that in this cave, this act of incest is basically happening, and yet there's light coming out of the darkness, just like God creating the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, right? So the day begins in darkness in the evening and moves towards the light. Shabbat, the brightest of all days. It is at the end of the week, and then you go back into the darkness. The week, the first day of the week, the day of the sun is called, but it starts in darkness and moves towards the light of Shabbat. So you even see the week going from darkness to light. The moon, what starts the new month? The new moon, the conjunction moon, when it's total darkness, moving from darkness to light. The year, the cycle of the uh, earth around the sun, when you have the least amount of light, the cycle of the year starts in darkness and moves to the light. God is showing that in the sinful world, there's hope. We can move from the beings of darkness through sin into being restored and being recreated into beings of light. And so out of this cave, as I was meditating on this and praying about this, I'm thinking, what a horrible, atrocious, you know, seemingly uh, act that's happening in this darkness of the cave. But light is going to come out of this cave in the fact that Yehoshua, the Messiah, and King David are the offspring of this union. And do you know the rabbis have known for thousands of years that Messiah would come from the lineage of Lot? Not just Abraham? So here's a little cave. Just made a little illustration. A picture's worth a thousand words. You've got Abraham's 
nephew, Lot. Abraham marries Lot's sister, Sarah, has Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, Judah of one of them. Judah has relations with the granddaughter of Melchizedek, which is Tamar. So Yeshua is actually through the order of Melchizedek, and he's through the line of Judah. And Lot, through his daughter, has Moab and Ammon. It's through Moab that Ruth comes. And Ruth marries the grandson of Judah's son, Perez. His name was Boaz. And they have a child named Obed. And Obed has a son named Jesse. And Jesse has a son named David, which becomes king of Israel and unifies all Israel. And of who it is said that Mashiach will reign on his throne and unify Israel once again. And who comes from David's lineage? Yehoshua. So light comes out of the darkness of this cave with this incestual act. And we can have a high priest who's touched with the feeling of our infirmities because even his lineage has murderers, incest, rape, theft. You can't say that, oh, well, he had an advantage. And he had no advantage that you don't have. You have the same access to the Father that he had. And he came to live as an example of how to live, be a living Torah. Each one of us should be living Torahs as he is. So, out of this cave, amazing things happen. It seems, you know, when you first read this story, especially when you're young, you're like, whoa, <laughs> what is this? I thought Lot was a good guy, and what good things could come out of this incestual, incestual act? But you see this amazing story that God is unfolding. So they plied with their father, and they slept with him. And the next night, the older... Uh, says to the younger, here I slept last night with my father. And she became pregnant from that one night. Let's make him drink wine again and you go in and sleep with him. And that way we'll enable our father to have descendants, plural. And they plied their father with wine that night and the younger one got up and slept with him and didn't know when she lay down or when she got up. Thus both daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The older one gave birth to a son and called him Moab. He is the ancestor of Moab to this day. The younger also gave birth to a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the ancestors of the people of Ammon to this day. And you know, in prophecy, we love prophecy, and when we were doing our study in the book of Daniel, do you remember Daniel 11, when it talks about the last days and how this king of the north, this type of antichrist, is taking over all of these different countries? Who escapes his hand? Moab and Ammon. Interesting. God's remembering the descendants of Lot even in the last days. Now, they're probably like Israel. They don't even know their own identity, right? But they will be preserved. I find that interesting. Mercy. Mercy. <laughs> <clears throat> Chapter 20 takes the focus back to Abraham. And it's going to tell the story of Avimelech. It's a short chapter. Avimelech travels there from the Negev, which is in south of Israel, and lives between Kadesh and Shur. And while living as an alien in Gerar, which is Philistia, Abraham was saying of Sarah his wife, she's my sister again. So Avimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Avimelech in a dream one night and said to him, you are about to die because the woman you have taken, she is someone's wife. Now Avimelech had not come near her, so she had not been defiled either by Pharaoh or by Avimelech. And so he said in this vision, in this dream, Lord, will you kill even an upright nation? Didn't he himself say to me, she's my sister? In essence, I didn't take her by force. Uh, I had no idea that she was um, her, his wife. And so he didn't... Abimelech was considered a righteous king. Yes. His name even connotates that. Avi Melech. It's my father, the king. And so he's a right example of what a king should be, even though this is in the very early days before the Philistines totally went wicked. Um, he was an early ruler of what is now the Gaza Strip, basically, if you want to put it in geography terms. So he says, Lord, will you kill an upright nation? Didn't Abraham say that he, she was his sister? And, he even, and even she herself said, he is my brother. In doing this, my heart has been pure and my hands are innocent. 
God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that in doing this your heart has been pure, and I too have kept you from sinning against me. This is why I didn't even let you touch her. Therefore, return the man's wife to him now. He is a prophet. I think this is beautiful. It establishes Abraham as not only our patriarch, our father, but as a prophet as well. And he will pray for you. A prophet knows how to pray. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So now, what's beautiful, out of this, what God allowed to happen, Avimelech is going to get a special blessing. Because Abraham, this prophet, this righteous man of God, is going to say a special prayer for him. And Avimelech is going to send Sarah back untouched, unscathed, with great wealth to Abraham. So Abraham's blessed, and the king of Gerar is blessed. It's a win-win situation. This is what happens when we are perfectly in God's timing. We don't go ahead of the Lord, and we don't fall behind. Abraham was quick to act when God told him to do something, but he was very patient and slow to act if there was ever any tribulation or toil or anything that God did not ask. He was just waiting on the Lord. A good righteous example for us today. So Avimelech got up early in the morning, called his servants, and when the men heard this, they became very afraid. Then Avimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I sinned against you to cause you to bring on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done things to me that are just not done. Avimelech went on asking Abraham, whatever could have caused you to do such a thing? Abraham replied, it is because I thought there could not be possibly any fear of God in this place. So I thought you would kill me in order to take my wife by force. But she actually is also my sister, so I wasn't completely lying. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. So when it says father, a lot of times in Hebrew, it's also talking about, um, it can be like grandfather. It, you don't always know exactly which generation it is, but we know it was his brother's um, daughter. And through that, the daughter of his father. And so she became my wife. When God had me leave my father's house, I told her, do me this favor, wherever we go, say about me, he is my brother. So Avimelech took sheep, cattle, and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham. So now the great wealth is added to Abraham's uh, kingdom from not only Nimrod and Pharaoh, but also from the king of Gerar. And he returned Sarah, and Avimelech said, Look, my country lies before you. You can live wherever you like. To Sarah he said, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. That will allay the suspicions of everyone who is with you. Before everyone, you are cleared. Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Avimelech and his wife and slave girls so that they could have children. So he healed their wombs. Beautiful. For Adonai had made every woman in Avimelech's household infertile on the account of Sarah... Abraham's wife being there in his harem. Now, the promise of this covenant child, Yitzhak. Adonai remembered Sarah and what he had said, and Adonai did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore a son. And Abraham, in his old age, at the very time, whenever the Bible says at the very time, it's a significant. What it's talking about is at the very feast time of Shavuot that Adonai had appeared one year before. Now, I want to bring out some... Who has your sefer with you? Who would look up Jubilees chapter 15, verse 21? And somebody else, look up Jubilees chapter 16, verse 13. I want to give you the proof from the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Essenes preserved. And Jubilees 17, I will read. So who has Jubilees chapter 15, verse 21? Got it. So it's talking about covenant. Remember, Shavuot is the day of covenant, right? But my covenant... Uh with my covenant I will establish with, with Yitzhak, with Yitzhak uh -huh. who uh, Sarah shall bear to you in these days in the next year. In the next year. Okay, so it's establishing two things. One, this is a year before his birth, and two, he's the covenant child. I'm going to establish covenant with Yitzhak, who's a type of Yehoshua, on the covenant day that I make covenant. 
Now, what time of year was this? If you go back to the beginning of the chapter, look at verse 1. Chapter 15, verse 1. And in the fifth year of the fourth week of this jubilee, in the third month. What month is Shavuot in? in the third month. God's appearing to him on Shavuot, speaking of covenant, about this covenant child that's going to, that the future Messiah is going to come through and make covenant with Israel. So we have proof that Adonai was speaking to him, and it even says in the middle of the month, Abraham celebrated the feast of first fruits of the grain harvest. This is the wheat harvest. This is unequivocally Shavuot. And he offered new offerings on the altar. Now, who has Jubilee 1613? And she bore a son in the third month, and in the middle of the month, at the time of which Yahweh spoke to Abraham, Abraham on the feast of the first fruits of the harvest, Yitzhak was born. Wow, it says it in so many ways. She bore a son in the third month, in the middle of the month, the exact same time of the year that Adonai had appeared to Abraham, one year later, in the middle of the month, at the time of the feast of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, Yitzhak was born. Isn't this beautiful? Unequivocally, Shavuot. Now, you go to 17, 1. It says, in the first year of the fifth week, Yitzhak was weaned. Well, when you calculate this out, this puts him at two years old. He's being weaned from his mother's milk. And Abraham makes a great feast on Shavuot, on Yitzhak's birthday. And he has Yishmael there with him still, the son of Hagar. So he's about 15. And it says, Abraham rejoices and blesses Elohim because he had seen his sons and had not died childless. And he remembered the words which he had spoken to him. And it's on this day that he invites Shem, Melchizedek, along with Eber to come and be a part of that feast. So they had a big birthday party on Shavuot for Yitzhak. Isn't that neat? So remember that as we're going on, it just kind of sets the context, the rest of the story. Abraham circumcised his son Yitzhak on the eighth day, as God had ordered him to do, which makes Isaac the first to totally fulfill the covenant, just like Yeshua is the first one to totally fulfill the covenant. Because remember, Yishmael and Abraham, they weren't circumcised on the eighth day. Yes, they were circumcised, but it wasn't specifically on the eighth day, which represents eternity, perfection with God. Only Yitzhak was this covenant child to fulfill this. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Yitzhak was born to him. Sarah said, God has given me good reason to laugh. And that's what Yitzhak means. It means laughter. And it's funny how names like a self-fulfilling prophecy, because you grow into your name. And I was always a happy-go-lucky kid, always laughing growing up. And it's just you become a part of your name. So I encourage you when you name your children, it's so important to name them something that you want to for them to grow into. This is why most names either have Yah, like Eliyahu in it, or El um, has some aspect of the divine characteristic uh, in the child's name that they can grow into. So she's relating to this laughter that she couldn't believe. But now everyone who hears that it's actually come to pass will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham and Sarah uh, that Sarah would nurse children at 90 years old? Nevertheless, I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned. So now you know the rest of the story. He was two years old, right? And Abraham gave a great feast on the day that Yitzhak was weaned. So this is confirmation. This is how you can see the Torah is giving kind of an outline of not only the commandments, but of the stories. But it's not the full depth of the story. There's so much more behind the scenes. It doesn't even mention here that uh, Melchizedek, Shem, and Eber came on the feast. Uh, we get that from the lost books of the Bible from Jubilees, and Jasher tells part of the story as well. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom Hagar had borne to Abraham, making fun of Yitzhak. Now, between verse 8 and verse 9, you have a span of three years. You only get that if you study the lost books, because Isaac's weaned at two, but at five, he's sitting in the tent, just a little boy, and this young bow hunter, who's 18 years old now, and he's an archer, a skilled archer, Sarah walks into the tent where they should be playing and Ishmael has a bow drawn with an arrow in it pointing at Isaac. This is how he was mocking him. Basically saying, I can take your life any time that I want. You know? 
when Sarah saw this, she says, I'm not going to give him an opportunity to ever let go of that arrow. Hagar, get out of here. And she went and told um, Abraham what was happening. This is what's happening behind the scenes. So in the Torah, you're just seeing, it seems as if the child is weaned and this... Um, issue with Hagar uh, is happening simultaneously and it doesn't even tell you what's really happening with uh, Sarah, why she's so adamant. She realized Yitzhak's life could be at risk if this boy Ishmael, who's the firstborn, continues to have jealousy for his father's love and at the time that the inheritance is to be given, you know, could he be a threat to Isaac? So this is why it was so important to get rid of them so quickly. But the Torah just puts it like this. When Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom Hagar had born to Abraham, making fun of Yitzhak, well, the Hebrew word is mocking. He was mocking his life, that he had the power to take it. So Sarah said to Abraham, throw this slave girl out and her son. I will not have this slave girl's son as your heir along with my son Yitzhak. Abraham became very distressed over the issue and this matter of his son. He loved Ishmael as well. But God said to Abraham, don't be distressed because of the boy and your slave girl. Listen, everything that Sarah says to you, because it is your descendants through Yitzhak who will be counted, but I will also make a great nation from the son of the slave girl, since he is descended from you. And God actually gave Ishmael 12 sons. They became the 12 princes of Arabia, just like he gave Jacob 12 sons. So you see this parallel blessing, but the actual covenant has to go through Yitzhak and through Yaakov. So Abraham gets up early in the morning and he takes 12 loaves of bread, here it just says bread, and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting, her, um, putting it on her shoulder and on the child. And he sent her away. After leaving, she wandered in the desert around Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the child under a bush. Now, when you first read this story, you imagine Hagar with this little baby, and she's sent out to the wilderness, and she's sad. They're going to die. They're, you know, dying of thirst. So she puts this little baby under the bush. But remember, he's 18 years old, but it's still calling him a child. Maybe it's because of the way he acted. Maybe he was spoiled. Because sometimes it refers to uh, a man at 14. So these are little anomalies that we just kind of pick up on. So she say, lays this 18-year-old child under the bush <laughs> and went and sat down a ways off about a bow shot. Interesting that it uses an archer's term because he's an archer. And in the seals in Revelation, when it identifies the first seal being a rider on a horse with a bow and he's given power to conquer, these are the descendants of the two bow hunters, Esau, the descendants of Esau, the Palestinians, and the descendants of Ishmael is the Arabs. And they have conquered all of the countries around Israel. And this is what sets the scene for the second plague, for peace to be taken from the land. So we're literally in between the first seal and the second seal. The only part left of the first seal is that authority ends up being given to this rider on the first horse carrying the bow. And authority is given in the recognition of statehood, authority of the state, like in the Palestinian state by the UN. So we're living in Bible prophecy that is in its infancy and its seed right here being hinted at, at his being a bow hunter. And she said, I can't bear to watch my child die. So she sat there looking the other way, crying out and weeping. God heard the boy's voice, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's wrong with you, Hagar? Don't be afraid, because God has heard the voice of the boy in his present situation. Get up, lift the boy up and hold him tightly in your hand, because I'm going to make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went, filled the skin with water, and gave the boy water to drink. God was with this boy, Ishmael, and he grew. He lived in the desert and became an archer. Now, he wasn't such a bad guy. Like, a lot of times we get a negative thought or connotation about somebody. But do you know he continued to come up in harmony and peace with Yitzhak every Shavuot? Because this was Abraham's favorite feast. This was the the feast that God had made covenant with him, the feast that God had promised him a son, the, God, the feast that God had fulfilled that promise to him. So, And it was Yitzhak's birthday. So they would have this big family reunion every Shavuot, and Yishmael and Isaac would come from wherever they were living as long as Abraham was alive. So they continued to keep in touch. It's not as if he was... Uh, gone forever. But what Hagar was doing in taking her, him down through the Negev desert south, she's going back to her homeland. She was a princess. She was daughter of Pharaoh uh, from one of his um, harem. 
and uh, she would have had great wealth and recognition bringing her son back to marry not just anybody from Egypt but another princess so this is that royal Egyptian bloodline that the Arabs have that go is half Egyptian and half uh, Semitic half through Abraham yes Archie well, just between there, yes I mean it'd take a long time to walk or even get camel yep you have a whole new appreciation for these stories now that you've been there don't you <laughs> so she takes him down and um, God's with this boy and he lives in the desert and he becomes an archer and this correlates with Revelation 6 2 that first seal that I was telling you about he lived in the Paran desert and his mother chose a wife for him from the land of Egypt. At that time, Avimelech and Pichol, the commander of his army, spoke to Avraham, and they said, God is with you in everything that you do. Therefore, swear to us here by God that you will never deal falsely with us or with my son. See, Avimelech is kind of a title, and so Avimelech's son is going to take the throne after Avimelech is gone, and he wants to make sure that he will be able to live in peace with Abraham he says, um, Abraham says, I swear it. Now Abraham had complained to Avimelech about a well which Avimelech's servants had seized. Avimelech answered, I don't know who has done this. You didn't tell me and I heard about it only today. Abraham took sheep and cattle and gave them to Avimelech and the two of them made a covenant together. Abraham put seven female lambs from the flock by themselves. Avimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven female lambs that you've set over here? He answered, You are to accept these seven female lambs from me as a witness that I dug this well. Now, we know that in that area, Abraham had actually dug seven wells. This is why it's called Be'er Sheva. Sheva is the word for seven. Be'er is the word for well. But it's also the word for oath. So it's like you have the place of seven uh, oaths as well. So you have this play on the words. He's making an oath, a covenant with Avimelech, and there's seven wells there. But he says, you are to accept these seven female lambs from me as a witness that I dug this well. This is why that place was called Beersheba, well of seven, or well of oath, because they both swore an oath there. When they made the covenant at Beersheba, Avimelech departed with Pichol, the commander of his army, and returned to the land of the Philistine. This is where you get the first recognition or proof text that Gerar is Philistine and Philistine is Gaza. So you can see names changing over the years, but the area is still the same. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of Adonai, the everlasting God. This is a new title. Ever, Abraham lived for a long time as a foreigner in the land of the Philistines. Now, in our final chapter, we are going to see the ninth test that God tests Abraham with. Remember the ten tests of Abraham? Let's see if I put those on. I didn't put those ten tests, but I did last week. The ninth test was the sacrifice of Isaac, the binding of Isaac. The tenth test was the death of Sarah. And in every test, Abraham was faithful. So we're going to conclude our Torah portion with the binding of Isaac, and we're going to look at this symbol of this promised son who's really got a miraculous birth as not only a model of Yeshua, but then we're going to see this model of a promised son by miraculous birth dying and being raised to life in the Hoth Torah. It totally ties it in with Yeshua. Uh, there's so much symbolism. And this is the way Yeshua taught. He would walk with his apostles, and he would walk through these Torah portions and reveal himself in every passage that there was significance from the Father. So God tests Abraham, and he says to him, Abraham, and he answered, Here am I. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, Yitzhak, and go to the land of Moriah. There you are to offer him as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will point out to you. Now we know that becomes Mount Moriah. This is interesting. Abraham gets up early in the morning. He saddles his donkey, and he takes two of his young men with him, together with Yitzhak, his son. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, departed, and went toward the place where God had told him about. Now, do you know who is on Mount Moriah? This is where Melchizedek had his yeshiva with his uh, grandson Eber. This is where Abraham had literally been trained for 40 years in the oracles of the priesthood. So, also known as the Mount of my instruction. 
Yes, Mori, exactly. It has two words, I mean, two meanings. Mur comes from the term Mori, and also my instruction, the E, the Yod on the end of it is my, it makes it personal. Which is to say that when we take God's instruction as our own personal instruction, it's like a healing balm to our life. It's like myrrh. It has blessings, and it has health, and it has prosperity, all inherent in it. So I'm glad that you brought that out, exactly. Yeah, the mem and the resh, um, when you have mar, like the sea water is mar, and that's why in Spanish even the term um, sea is called a mar because it has bitter waters. That um, is where Mary gets her name from exactly. So it's good once you start seeing these Hebrew letters and how they work and play with one another, you can start to see different applications of them. No. This is the Temple Mount. And this is the Temple Mount. Now, Sinai was called Horeb. It had two different names. But this is Mount, known later as Mount Zion. And it's interesting. He says, take your son, your only son, Isaac. This is a reflection of God's only begotten. My beloved son, my only son that you see. And we don't have the rest of the story just in the Torah. But God doesn't tempt anyone, right? And he doesn't unnecessarily test anyone. That's not his objective, to catch you up. What was happening behind the scenes, just so that you know the character of God and it's vindicated, is that Hasatan was questioning Abraham's faithfulness, much like he did Job's. He only serves you because you blessed him so greatly. Take away his blessings, or better yet, the greatest blessing that you've ever given him, the thing that he cherishes the most, more than money or anything, this son of the covenant that you've promised him. Ask him to sacrifice it and see if he puts you first, even above this son. This was what was going on behind the scenes. So Abraham, he trusted so much in God. He knew God was not a killer and God's not asking him to kill. But if this was my test, he's basically saying, I know that God is not only faithful, but he can raise him from the dead. So I'm going to be faithful and I know God will also be faithful. So if I give my son to God, he's going to give him back to me because I didn't have him in the first place. And he created him by miraculous birth. So this is what's going on with Abraham's mindset and his faithfulness, but also what's happening with Hasatan, uh, you know, questioning him. And it doesn't stop there. When Abraham proves faithful and he starts to take his son and his two servants, Ishmael and El Eliezer, to Mount Moriah, the place where God has placed his name, Satan's like, uh-oh, he's going to prove his faithfulness. So then he appeared as an old man before him. And he said, Isaac... Your father's old. He's senile. God would never ask him to kill you. You know, he would never. So rebel against your father. Now, Isaac's 25 years old, according to the book of Jasher at this time. He's going as a willing sacrifice, just like Yeshua. He's the willing sacrifice. And he's trusting his father. Just as Abraham is trusting his father, Yitzhak is trusting his father. And he is being tested. And he proves faithful in the test. And he doesn't listen to Hasatan. Then he comes and manifests a river, such a deep river that there's no way that you could get from where you are to Mount Moriah. It's like, last time I walked this path, there was no big river here. It looks so realistic. Abraham, he, he wanted Abraham to turn around, to give up, or to use it as an excuse, like sometimes we do, you know, we start to do what God asks us to do, but then we're looking for the first opportunity to find an excuse to back out of it. Abraham just starts walking in the water, faithfully. And then, of course, it's a, uh, it goes away. You know, it's just a false manifestation. So in all these ways, yeah, I want you to, it's a, like a mirage. I want you to realize the spiritual warfare that we're in and how each one of us are being tested in different ways that God is calling us to be faithful. Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to keep our eyes on Him? Or are we going to allow the enemy to catch us up and to thwart the beautiful purpose that God has for us? You had something, Terrence? I was going to ask, is that you walking up to Mount Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I don't know the exact place where these waters were manifested, but you're right. In Revelation, it says, out of the mouth of the dragon, he seeks to consume the descendants of the woman, which is Israel. And we know how 
Israel has been lost amongst the nations, right? But God promises to gather them back in the last days. He seeks to wipe them out with a flood of water. Now, waters in prophecy is peoples, nations, and tongues. So this is a group of people that the enemy is going to use to do his persecuting agenda against God's people in the last days. And we see Islam arising on the scene, fulfilling that very... The earth opens his mouth. Yes. And only in Islam can the prophecy be fulfilled where there's a 200 million man army because no country has anything close to that. America has one million counting all their reserve. China has two million. But every boy 12 years old and older is a jihadist and they have 200 million warriors for jihad for Allah um, fulfilling the like waters, their peoples, their nations, their tongues the end time prophecy. So isn't it neat to be able to apply all of these things simultaneously within these? And Messiah's living waters are going to flow from the throne after Jerusalem's been raised up on high. His living waters will flow both to the east and to the west and heal the waters of the eastern sea, which is the Dead Sea. Yeah, the, all the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah that are causing that place to be a dead place and no life to thrive in that water are going to be healed and it will teem with every kind of fish and fishermen will cast their nets there once again. That's so, it's over 4,000 feet difference in elevation. Yeah, from Jerusalem. So there's Jerusalem, yeah. major gravity feed there. <laughs> well, if you do a crucified for 33 years, yes. Um, Yeah, it doesn't have to correlate with his age. There's enough other symbolism that uh, fits. So here they are going. Now you know the rest of the story. He gets up early in the morning. He doesn't hesitate uh, to fulfill whatever God has asked him to do. This is why it says he got up early in the morning. What it's showing that it, as painful as it would be to take your child to their end demise, he's acting promptly when God asks him to do something. He saddles his donkey and he takes his two young men, which were Ishmael and Eliezer, together with Yitzhak, his son. He cuts the wood for the burnt offering, and guess who's carrying the wood for his own sacrifice? Yitzhak, another symbol of Yehoshua. And he's asking the whole time, Father, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? God will provide, Abraham's saying all along the way. God will provide by faith. Okay, Dad, I'll trust you on this, carrying the wood for your... Yeah. That's right. On the third day, interesting, nothing is by accident, right? Abraham raises his eyes and sees the place in the distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go there, worship and return to you. Now they're going to worship on this mountain. This is another connotation of the holiness of this mountain. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, laid it on Yitzhak, his son. Then he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they both went on together. This is actually the first mention of worship, and it has its connotation in the center of worship, Jerusalem, and more specifically, Mount Zion, the Temple Mount, the place where God placed his name, and the place where... Messiah will dwell as high priest and king for a thousand years. This is the first mention of worship. Right in the place, yep. The exact location, even though it wasn't built there at that time. And along with worship, we're seeing an act of obedience. So what is our worship to God? It's not just about singing praises, and it's not just about believing, because faith without works is dead. We're seeing worship, true worship, coupled with obedience. Isn't this beautiful? Mm, love these nuggets. Yitzhak spoke to Abraham, his father. My father, Avi? He answered, Hineni, here am I, my son. He said, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham replied, God will provide himself the lamb. Look at the way the Hebrew puts it. God will provide. I would have just said, God will provide, right? Keep it short and sweet. He says, God will provide himself the Lamb. The Word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God Himself will provide the Lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And they both went on together. They came to the place God had told him about, and Abraham built the altar there and set the wood in order, bound Yitzhak his son, and laid him on the altar on the wood. Then 
This would have been north of the Damascus Gate, basically where the place of Golgotha is, the same place where Yehoshua hung on the cross. Then Abraham put out his hand, took the knife to fulfill this act of sacrificing his son to Hashem. But Hashem never asked for human sacrifice. And it was never God's intent that Isaac be sacrificed. This was a test that Hasatan had asked for. And just by raising his hand, he proved faithful and he sent an angel to stop it. And the angel of the Lord called out to him, out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham. He answered, Hineni, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you are a man who truly fears God because you have not withheld anything, even your son, your only son from me. Interesting that it's saying from me. First it says an angel of the Lord, angel of yod heh vav -Heh, but then it's referring in the pers first person. So see how God even manifests himself sometimes to reach out to us and we think it's something else, but then you get glimpses of who's really speaking by the language. Abraham raised his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the bushes by its thorns. This is why we blow a ram's horn traditionally in Israel. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the place Adonai Yireh, which means Adonai will see to it and that he provides. As it is said to this day, on the mountain, Adonai is seen. And he is seen on that mountain and will be seen throughout the millennial kingdom. Where is the greatest display of God's character seen? On that exact place where Isaac was to be sacrificed as a type, the only begotten beloved son of his father, and yet the father wasn't doing the killing. It's the same place that Yehoshua died. And we see God more clearly through Yehoshua, through his great love for us, and through the self-sacrificing uh, example of willingly laying down your life for your brother and for Israel. This is where we truly see God. And so Abraham called it Adonai Yira. The angel of Adonai called to Abraham a second time out of heaven. He said, I have sworn by myself, says Adonai, yod heh vav -Heh, because you have done this and you haven't withheld your son, your only son, I will most certainly bless you. And I will most certainly increase your descendants to as many as there are stars in the sky or grains of sand on the seashore. Your descendants will possess the cities of their enemies. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you obeyed my order. So Abraham returned to his young men. They got up and went together to Beersheba. Who is he going back to Beersheba, to his tent with? All three of them that he came with? Just the two servants, Ishmael and Eliezer. Where's Isaac? Where's Yitzhak? He's, he leaves him to be mentored by Melchizedek, just as he was mentored in the oracles of the priesthood. He leaves Yitzhak there on the Temple Mount where uh, Shem, Melchizedek, and Eber are. And he only goes back with his two. Imagine Sarah looking, you know, from afar for their return, hoping, and then she sees him. But Isaac's not there. Oh, how her heart must have sunk. You know, when you go through a traumatic experience in your life, you ever seen how people can almost get white overnight? Imagine, they, it is said that the fear of losing Isaac and, and that this happened really caused Sarah's death. Uh, like it was, not at that exact moment, but it really affected her. She really thought that she had lost her son. So, Abraham returns with his young men. They got up, they went together to Beersheba, and there he settled. Afterwards, Abraham was told, Milcah too has borne children to your brother Nahor. So this is how he learned about the family of Laban up in the north. Uts, his firstborn, Boots, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pilda, Yidlaf, and Betuel. Betuel is the one who fathered Rivka the wife, future wife of Yitzhak. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, up in Lebanon, up in the north. His concubine, whose name was Reuma, bore children also, Tevak, Gacham, Tehash, and Ma'acha. And this is where the Torah portion leaves us 
for next week. But we're going to go on into the Hof Torah just really quickly before we close. And I want to show you the beautiful correlation of why during the years that our forefathers were prevented by the Greeks in studying the Torah portion and teaching it to their children uh, every Shabbat, they would replace particular passages from the prophets that would parallel the analogies brought out in this Torah portion. Look at how they chose 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 37. In this week's Torah reading, God promises a child to Abraham and Sarah despite childless Sarah's advanced age. In the Hof Torah, it describes a similar incident through the prophet Elisha many years later. He assures an elderly, childless woman who's barren, like Sarah, that she will bear a child. And there's two miracles that are discussed. So I'm just summing up the Haftor so it doesn't take so long for us. But it, after we get done doing the uh, Torah portions, what I'd like to do is teach you more in depth how these Haftorahs parallel the Torah portions. So two of the miracles in this Torah portion. The first miracle involved a widow who was heavily in debt, and her creditors were threatening to take her two sons as slaves to satisfy the debt. When the prophet asked her what she had in her home, the widow responded that she had nothing but a vial of oil. Elisha told her to gather as many empty containers as possible, even if she had to borrow them from the neighbors. So she was to pour the oil from her vial into the empty container. She did as commanded. This is where her faith in obedience performed miracles. She had this little vial of oil and this big earthen vessel and the oil just kept pouring and pouring and that vessel filled up. So she went to the next one, filled up the next one. Every single big vessel that she could collect from around the community got filled with oil. So much so that not only were her debts paid and her two sons restored to her, but they were... Um, yeah, they could live off of it. She profited greatly. Thank you. <laughs> the second miracle, Elisha would often pass by the city of Shunam, where he would dine and rest at the home of a certain hospitable couple. The couple even made a special addition in their home for Elisha to stay and to teach and to do his ministry there. When the prophet learned that the couple was childless, he blessed the woman that she should give birth to a child in exactly one year's time. This is exactly like Hashem coming to Abraham one year before Yitzhak's birth. And indeed, one year later, a son was born to the aged couple. A few years later, and, it, and Elisha would come and go according to wherever God called him, but he always had that little apartment that he could stay in when he was in the area. So he's off some other area, and the news comes to him from his um, servant that this boy had complained of a headache and died shortly thereafter. The Shunammite woman laid the lifeless boy on the bed of Elisha's, uh, you know, his apartment in his bed because she knew there's something that attends the spirit of a person. You ever thought about using somebody else's old mattress? You know, when you go to get a mattress, you only get a new one, right? You don't want any of that, those soul ties or any of that energy or any of those spirits that maybe somebody had. You don't know what that mattress has been through, right? But with a holy person, it's just the opposite. She's thinking if there's one place to, for this boy to be close to the power of God through the prophet Elisha, it's on his bed. So she lays him on his bed. And his servant comes to him and tells him that this boy has died. And Elisha tells him, take my staff and go and lay it on the boy's face. And because you'll get there faster, gird up your loins, basically run and sprint and I will be coming, but it'll take me a little bit longer. So the servant comes and lays the staff on the boy. Did it heal the boy? No. Nope. It took Elisha coming, just kind of like Lazarus being in the tomb three days and they're thinking Yeshua is prolonging. You know, this is to really establish that the boy is dead. Elisha comes and he lays himself upon this boy, fully, you know, warming the boy and uh, like a transference of spirit upon this boy. And the boy sneezes seven times and comes alive miraculously. So we have a model, just like Yitzhak being the willing sacrifice, but he was not killed and we see Yeshua the one who was a willing sacrifice and who was killed but raised again this half Torah perfectly connects the Torah portion with Yeshua in the boy that had the miraculous birth 
who was foretold about, who died, but who was raised again. Isn't that beautiful? We serve a risen Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and close with prayer. And then after we pray, let's sing the Visham Rut today. The covenant that God has made with His people who will keep His Shabbats in Exodus 31. Abba Father, we thank you for these deep and meaningful glimpses of Messiah Yeshua in your word and in your Haftorah. And we thank you, Father, for teaching us the model of selfless living to glorify you, Father, to die to self daily, like Paul said, may we glorify you and may we live a more humble life in service to you and in obedience. This is true worship and this is true faith. We thank you, Father, for showing us so much in your word and we just ask a special blessing upon this fellowship, upon our family and friends who are not here with us, and upon the food that we're about to receive, and the continued fellowship throughout your holy day, Shabbat, Father. We thank you so much for this day, and we ask that just as it is set apart from the rest of the week, may we be set apart as your holy people. In your holy name we pray. Amen.